Hello, my name is Corey McCarthy, and my presentation is on gifted and talented and twice exceptional students of color and how we can accommodate and support them, support their identification, support um, the requirements around identifying who these children are. We know they're there, but they're definitely underrepresented um, in education. I would like to give a quick shout out to our professor. You've provided amazing content and you have helped me become a better educator. So I thank you for that. I thank everybody for their feedback as well. What is a gifted and talented student? Students who are identified by a state as possessing or demonstrating abilities that give, give evidence of superior intellectual creative and academic capabilities. And these students are in need of, of instruction. Uh, they're in need of different kinds of services. And for me, um, I feel like students of color are given such limited opportunities to be great, to be amazing, um, to really see the world outside of their restricted environment. Um, and I think there's something that we, that I'm, I've become passionate about based on this course, and I really look forward to um, building upon the knowledge that I've gained while researching and, and, and learning about this particular demographic. Twice exceptional students, also referred to as the 2E, um, it's used to really describe gifted children who have characteristics um, of the gifted students who show evidence of one or more disabilities defined by federal or state eligibility criteria. These disabilities may include ADHD, speech and language disorders, behavioral and emotional disorders, and other impairments. What's really, um, what's really incredible about um, the research around talented and gifted and twice exceptional students is that the state determines criteria. And when you have a state that determines criteria, especially for students of color, there are some states who haven't quite made it into the 21st century in terms of um, socially accepting um, students um, of color um, who, because really there's this um, sort of unconscious and conscious bias against particular, particularly students of color in terms of what their capacity is. And, 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 cre and capacity sort of creates opportunity and I don't think edu educators take feel that responsibility. Um, and for me, I always want um, students to be at their best. And if we have a mindset of trying to teach and educate all students, I believe that this is an area where we can help students of color gain confidence, um, gain agency, increase capacity, and change trajectories. I want to take a look at I want you to take a look at gifted education at a glance. And there are some things that do stand out in this graphic. Um, there's 360,000 students um, who, I, I, who have been identified by their state as a gifted and talented student. Now, this doesn't count the students who are, who are not recommended. These are, this doesn't count the districts who are underrepresented. Um, this doesn't count a lot of urban districts. But with, out of those 360,000 students, 9% of those kids are of color. And in the Midwest, if you take a look at the graphic, there's $0 spent to support gifted education. You know, these are some of the things when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, you have a twofold demographic of talented and gifted students. And also, you have a demographic of students who have disabilities, yet there's a large part of the country that doesn't even devote time to it. And, and the states do not implement the, their support for these programs with fidelity. 
Um, a lot of the readings and a lot of the research really support um, the idea of, of having to financially back and having federal dollars put into this, um, into supporting students who are talented, gifted, and uh, twice exceptional. But at the bottom of the barrel is students of color who face particular challenges and issues in this um, the underrepresentation. As you know, they overturned the Brown versus Board of Education um, in the 1950s. So that allowed the separate but equal ideology um, to sort of to sort of lose its teeth, and they became it much like um, having support for disabilities. Um, students of color were able to have more resources and more support. But that was the idea. It didn't really happen, as you know. So they didn't factor in bias, social bias, environmental bias. They didn't, some, they didn't factor in these elements. Yes, we could give you the we could the opportunity is supposed to be there, but we're not going to give it to you. And we're not going to give we're going to give you a small piece of the cake but you're never, ever going to be able to make the, make the cake for yourself. Then No Child Behind, the No Child Behind Act came. And with the No Child Behind Act, they wanted more resources and, and you know, equitable, equitable um, distribution of, of instruction for all students. And it sort of froze out our gifted students and thus created another barrier for students of color to really, you know, they thought they were doing them a favor when it really increased the gap. But let's talk about some of the challenges that students of color who are talented and gifted and twice exceptional that they face. As I stated earlier, 9.4% of all of these students um, are of color. Um, out of the 360,000 that's been identified nationally. And you know, once you're identified, you go through a level of screening, testing, and what presents a challenge in 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 there in these neighborhoods is that these neighborhoods are are, are riddled with, with with poverty and 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 la a lack of resources, and schools don't have the money to spend on their most um, advanced kids. Uh, financially challenged districts which obviously are mostly, I mean, you have your rural, dist rural districts, but usually urban districts make up uh, most of the students, of, uh, are made up of students of color. Um, they don't really put the resources into it because they feel like they need to put resources into better instruction or, or um, teacher, hiring teachers or uh, programming or facilities, um, which are all problems that present themselves at my school. So, Massachusetts does not have a criteria for twice exceptional and gifted and talented students, um, which struck me um, as being wild. But I think Massachusetts is very confident in the educational system, the public educational system. They feel like uh, educators will, will have the gumption to come forward and say, hey, the student needs more support. The census did come out and say that 30% of the homes in urban areas uh, are single parent homes. Uh, so if you have single parent homes, there's a lot of there's a lot of variables that contribute to your to the lack of advocacy for students who are um, talented and gifted and twice exceptional. I mean, you have a battle you have to fight to get them disability services and then turn around and tell the district, whatever district you're in, that, hey, you know what? This student is talented and gifted. And if you're a parent, single parent working 16 hours a day. I think it's the last thing on your mind because you're just happy that your kid's going to school. I mean, my, there was a time where my personal story, folks thought that I was um, academically advanced. But my mom, she really did tell me, hey, I do not have the money to get you tested. I do not have the money to pay for you to go to a school where you could excel because you're an amazing writer and, a, and an amazing um, speller. And I... I hope there's no, no typos in there that will prove otherwise. So you have your limitations, um, and students, as, as a result, aren't even identified 
as being gifted. The twice exceptional students, in particular, in poverty riddled neighborhoods, they have disabilities, and based on their disability, especially in urban areas, um, they are they do face bias, and and that bias is 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 from peer to peer. It's from sometimes educators, and it's district wide where they believe that you can't be capable of being both. You have to have a disability. You you could have a disability, but you you are not capable of being gifted. So th this just represents yet another challenge that doesn't allow families to navigate through um, some person some some struggles um, in terms of identifying and really benefiting from the the natural gifts and talents that their children have. And then finally, instructors are just not likely to recommend students who are twice exceptional, gifted, and talented. Um, because they just lack cultural competence. Um, they, they, they think they either, I've, I've had some challenging educators that felt like, Hey, you know what? If this kid's not doing my work, this kid's a horrible person. So they don't really put the level of, um, of work and, and, and into the student. They believe and they operate from a belief that students, um, Students who are disabled uh, or who have a, a learning disability or who have ADHD or autism are not capable um, of, of being gifted. And um, as a result, they don't even recommend those students for any, for any services that support their many talents. So we have identified some of the challenges. Um, I mean, internally, there are some barriers that help that, that really hurt students of color that are not school related. Um, some, sometimes there's students who, how, how do we identify these kids who are in homes where the English is the second language? And, you know, you have to be gifted. I know some kids who come from other countries and they learn English in a year and they're speaking it better than some of the other kids. Their, un their understanding, their phrasing is, is improved. Um, their reading, their speech has all improved in a year. I mean, that's a level of of gifted of of, of giftedness um, in itself. Uh, the learning gaps as a result of frequent disciplinary actions by schools. I mean, they, the the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Schools, Secondary Education, they're cracking down on schools who are suspending kids of color because they are creating gaps in their learning, and it's not intentional. But it just goes back to the to the unconscious bias and and microaggressions that exist in schools that really hurt opportunities for students to really um, come into their own um, as compared to their suburban counterparts who have more money to uh, to to buy to 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 provide tutoring for their kids to provide opportunities to get personal and private testing. Um, so these sort of external barriers they do exist and uh, in the absence of school. Um, a lot of times in urban areas, students do not see positive images um, that link them, that they where they can see themselves linked to some of their talents, and and they are less likely to bring out um, some of these talents. I and and for me personally, my son, I you know I wanted so bad for him to identify what he wants to do uh, in his life. He's 16 years old and. He says, "Hey, I want to make batteries, and 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 I just want to be a, a, a an educator." And that's because he has a father in the house who is like always at questioning him. But he's not not everyone in the city is is that fortunate. And we, then we have to we have to really be honest that in most urban schools, the idea of of a growth mindset and promoting agency and teaching kids how to self-talk that does not exist because a lot of schools uh, are so stressed out by the MCAS or testing and, and so many elements that really stress their job, their personal job out. They don't really get to personalize, personalize their educate, their teaching. Um, and then there's a lack of accessibility. Um, you know, if you're not, if it's not talked about, it's not heard of. And um, I, I think that also hurts our, our students and, their ability to to have access to to unlocking their their talents. Solutions. What are some of the solutions and the recommendations? Um, well, I I think we should have another, we should add personally we should add another component to this sort of demographic. I think we should 
identify po- poverty as a disability. I think people are now realizing that poverty is trauma, uh, and and poverty contributes to loss, and and because of that, that could affect students um, social emotionally. And these things are hindrances to their personal growth as far as identifying and coping um, with their talents and while supporting them um, with their disabilities. Um, Change agents that affect policies, criteria, lawmakers, you, me, um, professor, we have to advocate for students the same way we advocate for, for, for more uh, support for kids who have um, hearing disabilities, the same way we advocate for kids who, who have autism, the same way we advocate for kids um, who who have um, cerebral palsy. We have to get after lawmakers. We have to get after headmasters, uh, well, principals. Headmasters is a bad word. Uh, we have to get after superintendents, and we have to really um, make this a point of emphasis to, to, to use policy to really affect change so we can get opportunities for our kids. Dual enrollment supports, if you don't have, for me, I, I, and all the research I've done, I've what works with identifying students who are um, twice exceptional, gifted, and talented, dual enrollment may help. Um, if a kid is performing at, at, in junior year, some of our kids at my school, we, have a, we do dual enrollment with Wentworth Institute of Technology, and you would be surprised that how, how well students handle um, college content, how, how well they connect with, with, with advisors. And I took my four students who are doing dual enrollment in my 12th grade group, and I said to them, hey, go seek out an uh, academic advisor. And three out of four have really, really um, said positive things about their academic advisor. So I think that could contribute to helping kids of color sort of, uh, dual enrollment could contribute to helping kids of color sort of identify um, what their gifts are. Support systems, academic advising, peer, peer-to-peer groups, exploration. Um, students of color benefit from people who have similar experiences. And I cannot stress that enough. They benefit more from student, from people who look like them, but they benefit a lot from people who do not look like them who are coming with a, from a culturally responsive and lens. And I, 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 I identify these things because I see these things happening within our students at my school. And it help, really helps them uh, prepare for college. Students of color in college um, who are twice exceptional, gifted, and talented. Um, I, you know, I think it's on the high school level um, and the district level to really encourage um, our students to who, who are represent this demographic to sort of seek out and, and supportive colleges and institutions and universities that have academic advising. My, my, my outlook on academic, academic advising is changed. Um, I mean, these folks are do amazing work. Um, having accommodations for um, twice exceptional gifted and talented students that support them, uh, that support them. Um, comfortable spaces, good, uh, strong meeting spaces, uh, less deadlines, um, having course content before they go to class, um, strategies to deal with anxiety, um, less restrictive environments, um, and then focusing on strengths. And if you always have a proactive approach, um, I believe that it brings the best out of folks because once you start as as a high point, you could maintain a level of balance of staying there um, when you talk strategies and have that sort of um, motivational approach with students. Organizational management, um, gifted and talented students, a lot of them do have ADHD, and, but they are very much connected to their phones. So I, I research has said that, you know, having apps on your iPhone or your Samsung that really support this, that really support the organizational instructors and reminders of uh, for students, um, have really helped students that they've seen some successful outcomes. And finally, supportive staffing. Um, you know, who you, who you are um, as an educator could really, really help change the trajectory of a student of color. Um, it could really, really, I implore you guys to always consider the, the whole student and, and understand that you have a responsibility to keep them out of the, school to prison pipeline. Um, Somebody did it for me. Somebody told me I was gifted and it 
changed my world. Thank you.